Hello there everybody, this is UXW Bill yet again with another episode of Kitchen Table Electronics Repair. And what I have here is an old TIAC VCR. This is a model number MV375 and TIAC is not the uh, first name that springs into most people's mind when they think VCRs, but they did make some along with audio equipment. And this one was something that I found at a garage sale for two dollars. Picked it up. The owners weren't sure if it worked. They had a Panasonic machine that was much newer and probably firmly in the black plastic crap territory. And then they had this older TIAC. And I am always on the lookout for older VCRs. Because one of the nice things about older VCRs is not only do they tend to do a good job of playing tapes, especially the nice uh, high fidelity stereo audio, you know, four or even more head machines. But it's also to do with their build quality. Now, I'm not above breaking some electronic device or smashing it or running it over if it's done something, you know, that's really made me mad, or typically only if it's a piece of total junk that can't possibly be fixed. I'd like to ask everybody that views this video, if you come across an old VCR, please don't smash it, don't break it, even if it doesn't work. Because here's the thing. The old VCRs are actually fixable, unlike the new ones, which have so many pieces made of plastic and so many things that aren't intended to be serviced, if service literature is even available, that it's just ridiculous to try and fix anything but the simplest problems with a new machine. Whereas these old machines can be kept going pretty much indefinitely as long as their heads remain good. So if you've got to get it out of your system, pick something that's a piece of crap. Don't use something that's got some potential of being fixed, like an old VCR, because there aren't any standalone VCRs being made any longer for the VHS format, as, long as, as far as I know. The only thing you can get in this day and age is the um, combination DVD or Blu-ray and VCR unit. And although I've seen a few of those that have passable quality, in most of them the video cassette assembly is such an afterthought that I certainly wouldn't want to trust any of my valuable tapes to it. Anyway, they said that one of the two VCRs didn't work. They didn't know which one it was. I told them I thought it was probably this one because the thing that happens with these old VCRs, they have rubber parts in them just like tape decks and the rubber parts go bad. So let's see what we've got here. Go ahead and plug this in and just see what happens. Whoops, polarized plug. It makes a pretty unhappy noise, that's what it does. Well, better go plug this camera in and charge it, otherwise I'm going to learn another lesson. Back in a little while. Alrighty everybody, I'm back again with the power adapter. So I can do whatever I want to now. <laughs> anyway, there is something definitely amiss in this VCR because right now you can see it's blinking a tape symbol along with the blank dashes indicating that the clock needs to be set. And it already made a relatively unhappy noise, so there's probably a belt or something similarly wrong in here. Now sometimes when these things break down, people try to retrieve their tapes and they'll end up doing uh, more damage than they should. Hopefully that hasn't happened here. I'll have to pop the cover and see, but first, go ahead and unplug it, and then I can take the cover off. All right, here's a cover off the VCR, and just a quick overview of what's going on in here, because this is a lot more complex than, a, than an audio cassette transport, due in part to the fact that uh, video, a video signal, requires much higher bandwidth than a simple audio signal, and so there's really a very clever trick that's used to get video onto the videotape in here, and that involves this tilted head drum right here. This uses a technique known as helical scanning. That's how I've always pronounced it anyway. I believe that's the correct pronunciation, but if it's not, feel free to laugh at me in the comments. What this does is this scans the tape going from a low angle to a high angle. Now, I strongly advise you not to touch the head drum in your VCR unless you know exactly what you're doing because you can really make an expensive mess of things. That is the one truly fragile part in any VCR that uses the uh, helical scanning technique. What happens here is that this, t this head spins at a much greater rate and encodes the information on the tape at an angle. Effectively, this makes the tape seem, electronically, to be moving by the head very, very quickly. And so information, much more information than could be stored by a stationary head, is able to be encoded on the tape. Over here, we have the erasure head. This over here is the audio and control head which is present in all machines, which is used to um, keep the machine's servos in time and things like that, and also to play back conventional monophonic audio. If you have a stereo or hi-fi machine, the audio 
there's another audio circuit in here, another audio pickup and recording head that is present on the head drum and spins along with the video heads. Now this allows a very high quality audio signal to be stored. Even though the recording method is only analog, the signal is stored very deep on the tape and it's possible to achieve basically a CD quality result if you use a good quality video machine. That's why some people use video machines as several hour audio recorders as opposed to going to some other kind of solution. Now some machines need to have a video signal even if you don't care about it to stabilize their head speed and to make sure that the servos are stable and everything. Over here is the rubber pinch roller and then here are the two tape drive reels and there's actually a gear shifting assembly here that moves between the two. Now this motor right here is most probably the tape motor and this little motor down here, this one with the black cap on its end is actually a sort of sequencing or transmission shifting motor. What this does when you, uh, when you load a VHS tape most machines will just sit there until you request an operation but some machines have what's called a quick start transport that actually preloads the tape and in order to preload the tape it actually gets pulled up and out of the cassette now machines that don't have quick start will do the loading the moment an operation button like play or record that requires the tape to be loaded is pressed. The advantage here is that a quick start machine can start up faster from a dead stop and be displaying or recording a picture much more quickly than a normal machine. However, a normal machine has the edge because it can rewind and fast forward without having to unload the tape. Now most quick starting machines will not fully unload the tape when they're winding unless you're going to be winding for quite a distance on the tape, although they do have to unload it at least a little bit for the rewinding operation because then the tape is going against the motion of the head and it might cause excessive friction. This is actually a sort of air bearing, that's what these lines in this thing represent. They actually allow the tape to gently float on the head, so in a properly functioning VCR, headwear should be very, very low because the tape is only making slight contact. Now this machine failed with the tape in the loaded position, and the way I know this is because these two loading arms are up here where they don't belong. Now the basket's back in its proper location, so my guess is that somebody managed to convince this thing to complete an eject cycle somehow. Either that or the microcontroller was willing to go that far before it realized there was a problem and shut down. And that is how the microcontrollers in many VCRs do behave. If they detect any kind of a problem, although it may be too late to prevent the tape being crinkled or being left loaded, they'll just do the safest thing they can, which is to go into a dead stop. And that's what this machine does. In fact, after that little blinking tape symbol has come on, it's impossible to turn the power on or anything. And of course, right there is the main system controller. This is all the video and audio processing circuitry back here. There's the RF modulation unit. And then back here is the power supply. So, in order to get at any of the belts or interesting rubber parts on this thing, I actually have to turn it over and take the bottom cover off because I can't really see anything up here other than to say that this machine quit with the tape in the loaded position because these loading arms are up and this pinch roller is pressed against the capstan drive. I'll probably also give this machine a cleaning and that's a topic I may talk about at a later time because if you don't know how to properly clean your VCR's playback and other heads you can really cause yourself a lot of grief. But I'll talk about that later. Let's flip this thing over and see what's going on here. Here I am on the underside of the VCR and I have definitely found the problem. It is a belt problem. There's no belt at all. I don't know if whoever lost a tape to this thing decided to do a little tidying up while they were working on it. I just hope this means they haven't done anything I'm going to regret. But this motor right here, which you saw on the other side of the transport, it's the one with the black plastic cap on it, is the sequencing motor. This actually drives the uh, mechanism through the loading sequence and moves the pinch roller into position and all that good stuff. Now there's something else going on here that's not entirely clear to me. This little pulley over here, by, from, by, my, by my analysis of the mechanism, would appear to be what moves the, uh, the tape basket up and down for the ejecting and loading operation. But there's no, there's no obvious source of power for this operation. However, on this, uh, on this pulley over here, there's another groove for a belt. And I'm not sure what's going on with that. I'm not sure if maybe there's been 
a little more cleaning up going on here than should have been or, or exactly what's going on. There's another thing that's curious about this mechanism. There's that large motor up top. And at first I thought, well, you know, that's going to be your tape drive motor right there. Just a simple DC permanent magnet reversible motor. No big deal. Well, there's more than meets the eye going on here because there's this large pancake motor as well. And as you can see, the relationship between all the belts here means that all this stuff is being driven or operated all at the same time. And so my hypothesis here is that TIAC uses the large DC permanent magnet motor up top for the fast rewinding and fast forwarding options. Operations, not options. And that the um, pancake motor here, which will be precisely speed controlled, is used to drive not only the cap stand, possibly, but also the tape itself for the playback and recording operations. But it would appear that the first thing I need to do is connect some kind of a belt between this pulley right here and this motor and just see what ends up happening. Now I don't actually have any belts on hand, but this shouldn't be a terribly speed critical operation as long as it succeeds. Now of course at nearly 11 o'clock at night, I work at night, I'm a night owl, which is when I do my best work, um, you can't really go anywhere and get rubber bands. In fact, I went up to one of the local convenience stores and thought, you know, well, maybe they'll have some rubber bands and being the eternal optimist that I am, maybe they'll even be reasonable, reasonably priced. Well, they didn't carry rubber bands, but the lady who was tending the cash register said, oh, we have dozens of those in our office, I'll give you some. And so she gave me three rubber bands right there. And I think these two are probably the most promising. They're a little longer than I'd like, but they ought to get this thing through a test at the very least until I can get the proper belt. Well, that is most assuredly not the perfect shape of rubber band required, but the other one that I have, which is much closer to the ideal thickness, is longer and so it may not work as well, especially if there's any point where this thing needs particularly high torque transfer. But this should work for a test until I can get the right part or see what else might be needed to make this thing operate correctly. All right, let's go ahead and plug this thing in. With my kind of luck, something calamitous will happen, i.e. it'll start to finish the unload cycle and reset itself to the proper, uh, proper state that it should be in, ready to accept the tape, and then the belt will fly off mid-sentence. So let's see what happens. Go ahead and plug this in, and I know it's going to start immediately. Sound a little rough, but it got it done. So that's always a good sign. And it's not blinking the tape symbol unhappy, unhappily anymore. So I guess the thing I ought to do is see if I can find a test tape, put in this thing, and just see how well it works then. Alrighty. The rubber band was good enough to get it through the unloading cycle. But when I stuck a videotape in there, I decided to pick something that uh, I didn't think anybody would really uh, cry too hard over <laughs> if the VCR decided it was a little bit hungry. And it tried to load the tape, but the rubber band just wasn't tight enough to uh, give it the needed friction to move the loading mechanism through all of its paces. I used to have a, a demonstration tape. This is kind of a funny story I like to tell. I used to have this demonstration tape that came with a pasta maker that I used to test uh, found VCRs. And I guess that a tape about making spaghetti was just what the doctor ordered to keep a VCR from doing the same because no VCR that I ever tested ate that tape, but I'll be darned if I can find it now. But the good news is that this mechanism is basically functional. The eject operation works just as soon as I... Uh, Carefully wound the tape back into the cassette so it wouldn't get crinkled on the way out. Luckily this VCR didn't decide to do anything too clever. So all I had to do was uh, carefully turn the, uh, turn the assembly on the bottom, that pancake motor, until the tape had been sucked back into the cassette from the aborted loading cycle. Reverse these things as I was pulling the tape back into the cassette so they would be down in their normal position. And then carefully, in the carefulest way possible, I applied power to this thing, hit the eject button immediately before it could think to do anything otherwise, and the tape came right up to greet me. So, there is hope for this thing. It will live again, and the other belts don't look to be in too terribly bad of a shape. They could be better, especially this one over here that does indeed, as I found out, this is the one that operates the eject basket, although I'm not entirely sure how that mechanism is made to work, it definitely does. So there you have it. That's as far as I can get for now. 
but at least now I know that it's probably worth putting in the time and money for a belt order to go ahead and fix this thing up. And I may go ahead and make measure measurements on the other belts and go ahead and replace them while I'm in here too.